I am not your perfect Mexican daughter. Chapter 16 I can't leave the apartment again because Ahmad decided to ransack my room to make sure I didn't have anything else that might be considered scandalous or immoral. At first all she found were an old clothed cigarette and a pair of shorts she didn't like. But then she tried reading my journals, even though she doesn't understand English. Unfortunately, she does recognize bad words. So she ripped out all the pages that contained fuck, bitch, shit, and even sex, which were incredibly common, of course. I screamed and begged for her to leave my journals alone, but she went through them anyway and left me with only a dozen pages or so. I was hysterical and tried to swipe them from her, but Appa held me back. I cried on the floor in the fetal position for hours after. I couldn't find the motivation to get up, not even when a roach crawled near my head. Life without writing doesn't feel worth living to me. I don't know how I'm going to make it a graduation because I feel like a husk of a person these days. Some of the poems Amma destroyed I had worked on for years, and now they're gone. Poof. Just like that. I'll never see them again. The one thing I love most in life has been taken away from me. What the hell do I do now? I'm still lugging Olga's laptop in my backpack, so she doesn't know I have it, but that doesn't even seem to matter much anymore. I don't know if I'll see Connor again. It's been three weeks since our last phone call, and it feels like a lifetime. I miss him so much I can hardly stand it. I've almost called him many times, but when I get to the payphone, I tense up and turn around. I have no idea what to say. I'm almost positive that I'll just end up crying again because things are even shittier now. Besides, it's obvious he doesn't want to be with me. Why would anyone want to put up with all my problems? Christmas vacation was almost as bad as last year's. I don't know if it's worse to spend all day in my room or struggle through my classes and be forced to speak to other human beings. Sometimes I can't make it through the day without losing it, so I have to take crying breaks in the bathroom, which makes me feel extra pathetic. Lorena keeps asking me if I'm okay and if she could do something to help me, and I say I'm fine, although I'm so far from fine that I don't even remember what it is anymore. I feel like my heart is covered with spines. Mr. Ingman keeps wondering why I've been missing our after-school college sessions. He's excited that I got a 29 on my ACT. If I didn't feel like absolute garbage, I'd probably be excited too. I try to avoid him, and when I do run into him, I tell him that I have to work with my mom in the evenings. My history teacher, Mr. Wynn, often asks how I'm feeling. He looks worried, but what can I tell him? How can I begin to explain? I just keep relying on the trusty old period card. In English class today, we discussed one of my favorite Emily Dickinson poems, and it felt as if something were splintering inside me. When we got to the part about the bees, my eyes ached from holding back tears. Instead of walking home after school today, I take the bus downtown. I'm not even sure wh where I'll go or what I'll do. I have no money or destination, but I can't bear another evening locked up in my room. I don't care about the repercussions. I give up. I finally decide on Millennium Park because it's the closest thing I can get to nature and because it's free. It's still freezing, so of course no one is around, only a few annoying tourists who, for some stupid reason, thought it was a good idea to come to Chicago in the winter. The cold here feels barbaric, inhumane. Why would anyone want to come to a place like this? The snow is pretty when it falls, but it hasn't snowed in about a week. All that's left now is slushy and gray or yellow from all the dog pee. I wish winter would pack its bags and get the hell out already. The amphitheater is completely deserted, so it's almost peaceful. The silver architecture looks kind of ridiculous to me, like a spaceship and spider web fused together, but everyone always takes pictures of it like it's some sort of masterpiece. I smile when I remember the time Lorena and I came to a summer concert here. We didn't even like the music, some kind of folk band from Serbia or some shit. But it felt great to be outside under the moon and three sad city stars. I thought maybe Connor and I would come here in the summer too. I walk toward the ice skating rink and the sky begins to darken. I wish I had a few dollars for a cup of hot chocolate, but I barely have enough to get back on the bus. I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of feeling like the rest of the world always gets to decide what I can do. I know I should go back home, but I can't seem to move. I can't keep going like this anymore. What is the point of living if I can't ever get what I want? This doesn't feel like a life. It feels like a never-ending punishment. My body shivers and the thoughts in my head become hot, confusing swirls. I can't seem to breathe right. Go home, go home, go home, I tell myself. But I just stand there, watching a blonde boy with ruddy cheeks skate in a tiny circle until his mother yells that it's time for them to leave. Chapter 17 
I wake up in a hospital bed with a mop peering over me. I have a headache so deep it feels like someone pummeled my brain with a meat tenderizer. For a few seconds, I'm confused about what I'm doing there. But then I look at my wrists and remember what I did last night. Mija, Ama whispers and touches my forehead. Her fingers are cold and damp. She looks terrified. Apa stands near the door looking at the floor. I don't know if it's because he's ashamed, sad, or both. I don't know what to say. How could I possibly explain this? I begin to cry, which gets Ama started too. I've never been very good at life, but man, was this a stupid thing to do. A short man in his twenties and an older lady with light brown hair and green eyes come in and stand at the foot of my bed. Even with her clipboard and white coat, she looks like she should be in vogue or something. Hi, Julia. My name is Dr. Cook, and this is our interpreter, Tomas. He's going to tell your parents what we're saying. Do you remember me from last night? I nod. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I have a headache, but that's it. I wipe my eyes with my gown. Can I get out of here now, please? No, not yet, sorry. We're going to have to keep you for a bit just to make sure you're okay. Maybe we can let you out tomorrow morning. I feel a little disoriented by all the translating. My head keeps throbbing. Too many people are talking at once. I guess they didn't trust me to interpret for my parents. I don't blame them. I swear to God I'm fine. I'm not going to do it again. I realize how dumb this was. I don't even know why I did it. Of course I know why I did it, but I don't think that's going to help my case. Dr. Cook smiles apologetically. This is really serious, Julia, and we have to figure out a way to help you. It's not going to be like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, is it? Because I'll bust out of here in that case, just like Chief. I'm not joking. I will lift a drinking fountain or sink or whatever with my bare hands and break a window and run off into a field and no one will ever see me again. The end. I rub my temples and my fingers. Why does my head hurt so much? Did you give me a lobotomy? Tomas doesn't know how to translate what I said, so he just looks at us perplexed. Dr. Cook smiles again. You haven't lost your sense of humor. That's a good sign. Look, I know what I did was crazy. I won't do it again. I swear to God. Dr. Cook turns to my parents. We're going to conduct some more evaluations to make sure she's all right, and we'll figure out a plan from there. We'll see if we can release her tomorrow. Ama nods and says, thank you. Apa exhales loudly and doesn't say anything. The nurse will let you know when to come down to my office. Shouldn't be more than an hour, Dr. Cook says to me, as she and Tomas walk out the door. The office is so full of plants that it's as if I'm in a tiny jungle. It smells faintly of perfume, which is like a mix of fresh laundry, pear, and spring rain. I'm surprised by Dr. Cook's paintings, though. Judging from her elegant style, I thought she'd have better taste in art. Some of them appear to have been created to soothe crazy people, especially the one of the giraffe drinking from a pond. How are you feeling? She smiles, but not in a way that knows she feels sorry for me. It's real, a kind of gentle. I'm okay. So what brings you here? What's going on? I just got a little overwhelmed, that's all. I stare at a framed picture of a little girl on her desk. I wonder if it's her daughter. How long have you been depressed? Dr. Cook crosses her legs. She's wearing a tight red dress and black high-heeled boots that look like beautiful torture. Her hair is in a perfect bun, and her earrings are sparkly and elegant. I imagine she's a rich lady who shops downtown, drinks a glass of wine after work, and gets manicures on the regular. Man, I don't know. A pretty long time. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when. But it got much worse after Olga died. I know that for sure. How long have you thought about hurting yourself? Well, it's not like I planned it or anything. I just kind of lost it last night. I remember Appa pounding at my door and feel ashamed. I didn't really want to die. Are you sure? Dr. Cook raises her right eyebrow. I sigh, mostly I think. Yeah. I get a flashback of my blood on my old green sheets. Where do you think it's coming from, that sense of desperation? What triggered it exactly? Did something happen? I don't know how to explain it. Yesterday it just all added up. I couldn't take it anymore. I got home last night and was shaky and hungry and sad and all I wanted was a stupid peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So I looked in the fridge and the only things we had were a container full of beans and a half gallon of milk. I said to myself, man, fuck this shit. I know that sounds stupid, but it just really pissed me off, you know. Then I couldn't stop crying. That doesn't sound stupid to me. Dr. Cook looks concerned and writes down some notes. What's stupid about it? I don't know. I say, like, why does everything hurt all the time? Even the dumbest things. Is that normal? Sometimes little things are symbols or triggers for much bigger issues in our lives. Think about why that particular moment caused you so much distress. I sit there looking at the floor. I don't know what to say. 
There's a black stain on the corner of her rug that looks like a paw print. It's so quiet, I can't stand it. She can probably hear my stomach growling. Take your time, she finally says. There is no rush. What's important is to reflect in a way that makes sense to you. I nod and look out the window for a long time. The view is super depressing, a snowy parking lot. The clouds have blotted out any trace of sunshine. A woman almost slips on a patch of ice. I take a deep breath. It's like, how can I explain? First, my sister dies, which has been a living hell. And there's just so much I want to do, but I can't. The life I want seems impossible, and it just gets so frustrating. What is it that you want? I sigh, a million things. Tell me about them. Dr. Cook adjusts the hem of her red dress. I wonder if it's exhausting to look so perfect. I pause again to gather my thoughts. The question overwhelms me and I'm not sure why. I want to be a writer, I finally say. I want to be independent. I want to have my own life. I want to hang out with my friends without being interrogated. I want privacy. I just want to breathe, you know. Dr. Cook nods. I understand. So how are you going to make that happen? What exactly is stopping you? She asks in a way that's not judgmental or anything, but really trying to understand. Hardly anyone talks to me like this. I want to move away to go to college. I don't want to live in Chicago. I don't feel like I can grow here. My parents want me to be a person I don't want to be. I love my mom, but she drives me crazy. I understand that she's upset about my sister. We all are, but I feel so suffocated. I'm nothing like Olga, and I never will be. There's nothing I can do to change that. I stare at the ceiling, wondering what life will be like when I go home. Do you think you'd ever hurt yourself again? No, never, I say, which is not exactly true. How could I ever be sure? But I tell her what she wants to hear. Can we talk about my mother again? Can we go back to that? Dr. Cook nods. Go ahead. It's like she never trusts me, for example. She is always, always opening the door without asking or knocking. And when I tell her I need privacy, she laughs. I mean, why would you laugh at that? And that's just one example. I could go on forever. What about your dad? What's he like? I sigh. My dad? He's, he's just there. What do you mean? Dr. Cook looks confused. I mean, he's physically there, but he never says much. He hardly even talks to me. It's as if I don't exist. Or sometimes I think he wishes he didn't exist. It's weird, though. It wasn't always that bad. He used to carry me and tell me stories about Mexico when I was a kid. He was always kind of distant, but when I was about 12 or 13, he really started ignoring me. I'm surprised at how much it bothers me to say it out loud. What's significant about that particular time in your life? I shrug. No idea. Dr. Cook writes something in her notebook. Do you think something happened to make him this way? I don't know. He never talks about anything. Tell me what his life is like. He works at a candy factory all day, then comes home, watches TV, and eventually goes to sleep. Seems pretty sad to me. Why is that? Dr. Cook uncrosses her legs and leans toward me again. She looks very serious. Because there should be more to life than that. Life is passing him by and he doesn't even know it. Or doesn't care. I don't know which one is worse. I blink back tears. And he and your mother immigrated here, correct? What country did they come from? When was that? Mexico in 1991. My sister was born later that year. Have you ever thought about how it might feel for him to leave his family and come to live in the United States? I imagine that could have been traumatic for him. Well, for both of them. I guess I never really thought about it before. I wipe my eyes with the back of my hand. The tears are relentless now. This is embarrassing. The crying? I nod. You're entitled to your emotions. There shouldn't be any shame in that. Dr. Cook hands me a box of tissues. This is the place to let it all out. It just makes me feel stupid, I say, and weak. She shakes her head, but you're neither one of those things. Dr. Cook says I can leave tomorrow if my parents agree to a short outpatient program for fucked up kids like me. I'll have to miss a week of school because I'll be there from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., but I'll be able to make up part of the work while I'm in there. It's certainly better than being locked up in a hospital. Because of my insurance through the state, the cost will be minimal, she says. According to her, it's set up for poor people like me. Actually, she doesn't use the word poor. She said low income. But it's the same thing. I guess it just sounds more polite. She also wants to see me every week for therapy and says I need to take medication to balance out my brain. It turns out I suffer from severe depression and anxiety which have to be treated right away or else I can end up here again. I've had it for a long time, but it obviously got much worse after Olga died. Something in my head isn't wired right. I'm not surprised. 
I always knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what it was that it had an official name. I stare out the window of my room, watching the city lights, when the nurse taps me on the shoulder. It's time for my pills. I have to take them in front of her and then open my mouth wide so she can see that I really swallowed them. Dr. Cook says that it will take several weeks to feel the full effect. My emotions are all over the place right now. One minute I feel like eating a torta, the next minute I want to cry until my eyes dry up. Suddenly, right when I'm about to turn away from the window to go to sleep, I see Lorena and Wanga standing on the corner across the street. At first, I can't believe it's them, but when I get a better look, I recognize Lorena's crazy hair and skinny legs. They start waving and yelling like crazy, but I can't hear what they're saying. I have no idea how they found out where I was. Lorena is wearing a puffy pink coat and is breathing into her hands. Wanga does a ridiculous dance that involves shaking his butt and flapping his arms like a chicken. I imitate the dance as best as I can, which makes them both laugh. I wave and smile. This goes on for a few minutes until the cold ushers them away. Our apartment is tense and silent. It's as if everything is holding its breath. Sometimes I'm convinced I hear the roaches scurrying. I think my parents are terrified of me. Apa is his usual mute self, and Amma looks at me as if she can't figure out how I once resided inside her uterus. I feel guilty for making them feel this way. I didn't mean to hurt them. That night, after talking to Lorena on the phone for nearly two hours, I unlock Olga's door and crawl into her bed. It's one of the only things that can make me feel better. Not even food comforts me right now, which is kind of alarming. And I can hardly read or write because nothing will stay inside my brain. I miss Connor, but I'm afraid to call him. I dialed his number a few times but hung up before it rang. It's not like I can see him right now anyway, which was the problem in the first place. I would never in a million years invite him over to our apartment for so many reasons. And I know there is no way for me to get to Evanston without freaking my parents out. But maybe I should risk it to get Olga's laptop to him. What if he's my only hope for getting it unlocked? Who am I kidding though? My parents would likely call the police if I left the house. And what would I say to Connor if I told him about what happened? He'd get all weirded out. Even if I try to keep it a secret, I would probably blurt it out because I can't seem to keep anything to myself. I don't want him to think I'm crazy because that would definitely scare him away and I wouldn't even blame him. For a second, I think I can still smell Olga in the sheets, but it's probably all in my head. Teen. During movement therapy, Ashley, the young therapist with the asexual mom haircut, tells us to say what we feel and bounce the foam ball however we want. The ball is an expression of our feelings, she says. I go first. I feel snacky. I drop the ball softly. Thank you, Julia, but that's not really a feeling, Ashley says as gently as she can. It is to me. I'm overcome with a desire for snacks. Okay, snacky it is then. Now it's Aaron's turn. Aaron was molested by her dad and speaks very slowly. Everything she says seems like a drown out question. How do you feel today, Erin? Ashley asks in her best therapist voice. Sometimes she sounds as if she's talking to a baby or puppy that's about to die. Erin looks around the room and then looks at the ball for what feels like an eternity. I want to scream at her to hurry up, but I just look out the window instead. I feel confused, she finally says and flings the ball toward the windows. Tasha takes the ball from the floor and says, I feel like my veins are full of sand. That makes me wince. Tasha is always saying horribly beautiful things like that. Sometimes I want to write them down. She's anorexic and probably doesn't weigh more than 90 pounds. Her wrists look fragile and breakable, and her long, skinny braids seem too heavy for her small body. Although she's emaciated, I can see that she's beautiful. Her eyelashes are stupidly long, and she has the kind of mouth that begs for bright red lipstick. Luis is next. He's here because his stepdad beat him with cords and hangers when he was a kid. He says one time he even put a gun in his mouth. Luis cuts himself now, and his pink scars crisscross down his arms and onto his hands. I've never seen skin like his. It's as if he's covered with a made-up language. I feel sorry for him, but he scares me, and it makes me uncomfortable that I can see the outside of his junk through his sweatpants. Someone should talk to him about it. How are we supposed to get better when we're subjected to such a vulgar display? 
I'm afraid of what Luis is going to say because he has a demented look in his eyes. After a few seconds, he says he feels sexy and laughs like a maniac. He bounces the ball so hard it almost hits the ceiling. Next is Josh. He tried to kill himself with some of his mother's pills, but his pink-haired girlfriend, he mentioned her hair three times now, found him and called 911. Josh's face is red and shiny with acne. His skin is so terrible that my own skin almost hurts when I look at him. How his pink-haired girlfriend was about to kiss him is a mystery to me. Josh looks as if someone set fire to his face, and it remained blistered and full of pus. His eyes are nice, though. Sometimes for a second, especially in the sunlight, they pierce through, and you almost forget about the lumpy redness on his face. Maybe that's what his girlfriend saw. Josh seems to have fed off Luis because he says he feels aroused. He laughs so hard, one of the whiteheads on his cheeks splits and begins to bleed, but no one tells him. Josh and Luis just laugh like buffoons until Ashley says it's time for our break. Josh, Luis, and I stand at the window and watch a blonde woman in a bright green dress and pointy black heels hurry down the street. Josh says she's a hooker on the way to work. Why does she have to be a hooker, I ask. Look at the way she walks. She wants to get boned, Luis says. You're gross. Why would you talk about a woman like that? Luis pretends he doesn't hear me. Next, we see a black guy in a leather jacket and baseball cap walking into a diner. He's dealing drugs, Luis says. Crack for sure. I turn to Tasha to see if she's heard them, but she's sitting across the room with the magazine on her lap and staring off into space. Sometimes I want to talk to her, but she's as quiet as a sealed jar of air. So you guys are sexist and racist. How charming. I glare at them. Erin comes over, smoothing her short, black, her short dark hair. What's up? What are you guys talking about? Julia here is killing our vibe. Luis points his thumb toward me. Oh, shut up, Luis. Stop being a dirtbag. Fuck, man. Stop being so uptight. We're just joking. Jeez. Luis pokes my shoulder and walks away before I have a chance to respond. When I head over to the water fountain, Antoine, the new kid with the wispy afro, comes up to me and asks me to be his girlfriend. He just got here an hour ago and he's already trying to get a date in a part-time nut house. It's almost funny. Are you serious? I ask him. Is this really happening? I look around and pretend to address a crowd of people. Come on, girl. Let me take you to the movies when we get out of here, he says, picking at his hair with a giant comb. First of all, you're like, what, 13? Second of all, I don't want a boyfriend. Don't you see that I just try to kill myself? I say, showing him my wrists. But I'll take care of you, he says, swatting my hands. I'll borrow my grandma's car and pick you up. I'll take you to the movies. Antoine, you're a child, which means you don't have a license, which means that you can't drive, and I don't need to be taken care of. I can take care of myself. Antoine shakes his head. I walk back to our next session before he can say anything else. Every day is the same. Movement therapy, homework, lunch, group therapy, art therapy, individual therapy, then closing circle. During our breaks, we can read, play games, and listen to music. We're always fighting over what kind of music to play. The other day, Luis and Josh wanted to listen to heavy metal, and I said I'd rather eat a rat sandwich. I like aggressive music, but heavy metal makes me feel like I'm locked in a box draped with chains. No way. Sometimes I look out the window and zone out until our break ends. Today, Tasha walks over and stands next to me. Hey, she says in a whisper. I've never seen her speak to anyone outside of therapy. Everything about her is so quiet, as if she's trying to erase herself from the world. She only speaks when she has to. In group therapy, Tasha told us that for one week straight, all she ate was grapefruit. If I went that long without eating real food, I'd probably end up stabbing someone. She said this so softly that I had to crane my neck toward her and really listen. I wonder what it's like to be so delicate, to look at a plate of food and feel like it's your enemy. Hi, I smile. What's up? I'm sick of this place already. Yeah, me too. I write my name on the glass with my knuckle. How long will you be here? I don't know. They won't say. It depends on my progress. She twirls one of her braids around her finger. What about you? Five days total if everything goes well. I think I just need to avoid having another meltdown. Then I have to go to therapy, which is not so bad, I guess. Tasha pauses and looks at my wrists. Did you really want to die? I'm not sure what to say. How do I answer that? I'm glad I'm not dead, but living? Living feels terrible. At the moment, maybe I did, but now? No, not, not really. I don't look at her when I say it. I stare at the droplets of rain beginning to fall against the window. After dinner, Amma looks at Apa, and then they both turn to me. Mija, we think you should go to Mexico and spend some time with Mama Jacinta. What? Are you crazy? What about my therapy? 
after you finish the program. What about Dr. Cook? When am I going to see her again? You have an appointment this week, and then you can see her when you come back up, I says. This makes no damn sense to me. Some people think that shipping their children back to the motherland when they get out of control will solve everything. It's happened to some of the kids from my school, mostly gangbangers and girls who are ripe for pregnancy. Usually they come back exactly the same or worse. Maybe parents think their kids have lost their values, that they've become too Americanized. So is Mexico supposed to teach me not to have sex? Is it supposed to teach me not to kill myself? What if I don't get to graduate on time because I miss too many days of school? Ama sighs. It won't be for that long. I'm not going. I say, absolutely not. I need more time at home to recover, I add, trying to lay the guilt on thick. Ama and Apa exchange glances. I bet they have no idea what to do with me. They look desperate. That's the point. It'll do you good. You'll feel better. Ama folds and refolds her napkin. How? Your grandmother will teach you things. You'll get to relax. Ama tries to smile. Like what? Cooking? You think that's going to make me feel better? You used to love going to Mexico when you were little. You always seemed so happy you never wanted to come back. Don't you remember? That's true, but I don't admit it. I like to stay up late with our cousins. I love the smell of the dirt roads after it rained and the spicy tamarind candy from the corner store. But going there as a teenager? What the hell am I going to do? Make tortillas all day? And you'll get some fresh air and ride horses. Mama said you love that. Doesn't that sound nice? Ama hasn't been this friendly in years. I don't care about horses. I can hear the neighbors screaming at each other downstairs. Ama sighs and looks at the ceiling. Ay Dios, dame paciencia. What about college? What if I miss too many classes and I have to go to summer school? What if all the places I apply to reject me because I missed so much of my last semester? You can go to community college just like your sister. She didn't even graduate. What was the point of her going to school if all she was going to be was a receptionist? What's wrong with being a receptionist? It's a lot better than breaking your back cleaning houses. At least you get air conditioning. At least you get to sit down. What I wouldn't give for a job like that. Ama looks pissed. I cross my arms over my chest. Okay, being a receptionist would be my dream come true. There is nothing I'd rather do than answer phones. On my last morning of the program, I walk toward Tasha, who's playing solitaire in the corner. Can I sit here? I ask as I pull out a chair. She shrugs, sure. So do you feel any better? Sometimes it's tiring to answer the same kinds of questions over and over. I get sick of talking about my cousin, about food, about my mom. Tasha's voice is almost above a whisper today. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, how many times are they going to ask me to explain why I hurt myself? I keep telling them that I'm not going to do it again, but they don't believe me. Tasha nods. You know, I'm not sure how all of this group therapy is supposed to help. Listening to other people's problems doesn't exactly make me feel good. Sometimes it's nice to know you're not alone. Tasha lays down the queen of diamonds, like you're not the only one who feels like complete shit all the time. Do you think the feeling will ever go away? Do you think it's possible that we can be normal people who can be consistently happy? Tasha pauses for a long time. I don't know if I'll ever be a normal person. I'm not even sure what that is. Sometimes I feel happy for like a second, but then it goes away. I guess the same goes for me. I just can't convince myself to feel good. Like my body won't allow it or something. Instead, it gives me the finger. We're probably lacking serotonin. Tasha picks at a scab on her arm. Your brain forgets how to produce it, so you have to teach it how to do it again. I read that in an article or something like that. My parents are sending me to Mexico after I'm finished here. I sigh. Mexico? Damn, you're lucky. I've never even been out of Illinois. I don't want to go. I'm not sure how that's supposed to help anything. I think they're just afraid of me. I guess you won't know until you do. I know I'd be excited to get the hell out of here. As I stand near the door waiting for my parents to pick me up, Erin hugs me and says she's going to miss me. Tasha mouths goodbye and waves to me from a distance. Josh gives me a high five and tells me I'll be a famous writer one day. Luis screams, good luck, then runs away giggling. Antoine won't look at me. Even when I call his name, he just looks at the floor. It's cold and sunny when I walk outside. The wind feels nice on my face. After being stuck inside the stuffy hospital all day, it seems beautiful, even the muddy gray parking lot. The snow is beginning to melt, and I think I can almost smell spring. After five days of talking about my feelings, making terrible art about my feelings, moving my body to the rhythm of my feelings, it's time to go back to school. 
People keep staring at me like I'm a quadriplegic or something. When someone asks me when I've, where I've been the last few days, I say, Europe. Even though gossip travels fast and they can probably see how I obsessively cover my wrist with my sleeves and bracelets. Some ding-dongs believe me though. And when that happens, I keep the lie going, spinning it until I run out of ideas. I backpack through France, Germany, and Spain with my rich aunt from Barcelona. Then we jumped on a ferry to Scandinavia and took a tour of the fjords. Then someone robbed us and took our passports. Then we were forced to be a part of an international heist. I almost died in a police chase. Luckily, I survived to tell the tale. Wanga gives me a hug when he sees me in the hall. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? He has a faded black eye and smells like weed, cologne, and dirty laundry. I want to ask him about it, but I'm afraid to. I'm all right. The happy pills should be kicking in soon. Did you like my dance? Huanga smiles. It was lovely. It moved me to tears. I bring my hands to my chest and grimace. Please don't ever do that again. You know you can always talk to me and Lorena, right? Yeah, I know. Thanks. Stop trying to die, okay? He shoves me playfully, then puts his hand on his hip. Something about how he says it makes me crack up. I'm so bad at suicide, I tell him between bursts of laughter. I win at being the worst at killing myself. I'm a champion, an American hero. USA, USA, USA. That gets Huanga going. Girl, you are crazy. We laugh so hard, people stop and gawk at us, but we ignore them. Huanga leans against the locker and slaps it with his hand, all dramatic about it. Every time we try to stop, we look at each other and start all over again until the bell rings. When I see Lorena at lunch, her eyes well up. Although we talked on the phone, it feels like I haven't seen her in centuries. Stop, don't, I'm okay, I whisper. We already talked about this. Lorena takes a deep breath and wipes her eyes with the neck of her faded purple sweater. Why didn't you tell me? How could you do something like that? I just close my eyes and shake my head because if I open my mouth, I know what will happen. I'm so tired of having an audience. Dr. Cook is wearing a scarlet sweater dress, a chunky orange necklace, and brown cowboy boots. I bet her outfit costs more than our car, but I don't think she's the kind of person to show off about her money or make you feel bad for being poor. I'm not envious either. What I feel is more like awe. I mostly want to complain about going to Mexico, but Dr. Cook wants to talk about dating and sex again. There's not really much to tell. I've technically never had a boyfriend. I thought Connor was going to be, but obviously that didn't work out. Why didn't it? He said he couldn't handle not seeing me, that he wanted me to be his girlfriend, but we had to be able to see each other. And how was I supposed to see him when I'm basically living in a prison? We've already talked about this, the phone call, but I think she's digging for something else. Do you think that's reasonable? Dr. Cook asks, that he felt he needed more from you? I shrug. I guess. Why didn't you let him finish? You assumed he was breaking up with you without giving him a chance to express how he felt. Do you think it's possible that you were projecting a lot of your frustrations onto him? But I knew it was coming. Why would he want to be with me? It's too much to handle. Story of my stupid life. Dr. Cook lets it go for now, but I already know her style. She'll return to it. Okay, let's talk again about the day you hurt yourself. What led to it? After my mom found the condoms and underwear, it's like my whole life crumbled. I was already depressed, looking back on it, definitely. But when she got mad at me like that, I just felt so terrible. She hardly spoke to me and didn't let me leave the apartment for weeks. She already blamed me for Olga, and then when all that happened, it's like she really, really hated me. I can't ever be the person she wants me to be. And when I was sad about Connor because being with him made me feel good. He made me laugh, and for the first time ever, I felt like someone could really see me, you know? Dr. Cook nods and brushes some hair from her face. That sounds very painful, but why didn't you explain to her that the underwear wasn't yours, that it was your sister's? Because she probably wouldn't believe me, and if she did, I think it would destroy her in a way. The thing is that Olga was perfect to her. How could I tell her that she wasn't? Have you ever talked about sex, you and your mother? No, well, not directly. She just makes comments sometimes. Basically, she makes it sound as if it were the most evil thing a person could do if they aren't married. And what do you think about it? I don't see what the big deal is, and yet I feel guilty. I have these two competing feelings, you know. Like, logically, I think it's okay, but it still makes me feel like I've committed a crime or something. Like, everyone will know and pelt me with stones. 
Sex is a normal part of the human experience, but unfortunately, many people attach a great deal of shame to it. Dr. Cook crosses her legs. Maybe I should get a pair of cowboy boots, too. You could probably hurt someone with those fuckers. Yeah, my mom thinks it's the devil's work, you know. I just, I just feel like it's unfair that my whole life is unfair. Like I was born into the wrong place and family. I never belong anywhere. My parents don't understand anything about me, and my sister is gone. Sometimes I watch those stupid TV shows, you know, the ones where mothers and daughters talk about feelings and fathers take their kids to play baseball or get ice cream or some shit like that, and I wish it were me. It's so stupid, I know, to want your life to be a sitcom. I'm crying again. That doesn't seem stupid to me. You deserve all of those things. After my parents go to sleep, I go through Olga's room to see if I can find any other clues. Even if I did call Connor now, it would be impossible for him to unlock the laptop because I'm leaving for Mexico tomorrow. I start wondering if maybe she wrote the password somewhere. I mean, I'm constantly forgetting my email password, so I have it written down in a notebook. Maybe Olga had a crappy memory. I search through all her notebooks and scraps in her drunk drawer again. Nothing even remotely interesting. What if I'm wrong about my sister? What if she was the sweet, boring Olga I always knew her to be? What if I just want to think there was something below the surface? What if, in my own messed up way, I want her to be less than perfect so I didn't feel like such a fuck up? Finally, when I flip through her old planner for the second time, I find a folded receipt with some numbers and letters circled. I don't know why, but something about that makes my brain itch. I enter them into the laptop, nothing. I enter them again, nothing. I enter them for the third time and they work. I can't believe they work. Olga didn't have much on her hard drive, just some boring pictures of her and Angie and old papers from her intro to business class. Luckily, I'm able to connect to the neighbor's Wi-Fi and Olga's email password is the same as her laptop password. There are hundreds of spam emails from many different companies. I guess the spam bots don't know when someone has died. It seems so disrespectful to advertise to the dead. 50% off store wide. Buy one. Get one free shoe sale. Vitamins for the perfect bikini body. I scroll and scroll forever to find anything that isn't an advertisement. Finally, there it is. What I've been looking for all along. Chicago65870 at bmail.com. 7.32 a.m. September 6, 2013. Why are you being like this? I'm giving you as much as I can. Don't you see that? You know I love you. So why are you always making me feel so guilty? Holy crap. What in the world was my sister doing? Obviously she had a boyfriend, but who was he? I jumped to the oldest ones to read them in order, which takes me forever because there are hundreds. My heart pounds. Chicago65870 at bmail.com 1.03 a.m. September 21st, 2009. I can't stop thinking about you. Los Ojos at bmail.com 1.45 a.m. September 21st, 2009. Me neither. When can I see you again? Do you know how hard it is to see you every day at work? I don't know how to pretend. My heart races every time you're near me. Chicago65870 at bmail.com, 10 p.m., November 14th, 2009. Meet me at the diner tomorrow for lunch. Sit in the back so no one sees you. Wear the red shirt I like. Los ojos at bmail.com, 8.52 p.m., January 14th, 2010. When are you going to tell her? I'm tired of waiting. You promised. I can't keep doing this forever. I love you, but you're tearing me apart. You're killing me. Chicago65870 at bmail.com, 12.21 a.m., January 28th, 2010. Soon. I told you already. You don't know how complicated it is. I have to think about my kids. I don't want to hurt them. You know how much I love you. Can't you see that? Can't you understand that? Please stop being so selfish. I'll see you tomorrow at the sea, 6 p.m. Los ojos at bmail.com, 8.52 p.m., January 29th, 2010. What do you mean, selfish? All I do is wait for you. I don't know if I can do this anymore. This is destroying me. I can't eat. I can't sleep. All I do is think of the day we finally get to be together. Don't you care? Then the internet gets cut out. It feels like I'm getting to the end of a book only to discover that the last page has been turned in half, torn in half. Dull. Dutiful Olga was sexing a married man. 
This explains almost everything. Her faraway look, the hotel key, the underwear, the reason she never graduated from community college. She was with him when she was supposed to be in class. This guy strung her along for years. How could she be so stupid to believe he was actually going to leave his wife for her? I've read enough books and watched enough movies to know that never, ever happens. Who was he? How old was he? How can I find out more about him? The emails are so secretive as if they were both terrified to ever get caught. From what I can gather, he worked in her office, was married, and had children. But I probably still have dozens and dozens of emails to get through. How could I have been so dumb not to notice anything? But then again, how would anyone have known? Olga kept this sealed up and buried like an ancient tomb. My whole life I've been considered the bad daughter, while my sister was secretly living another life. The kind of life that would shatter Ama into tiny pieces. I don't want to be mad at Olga because she's dead, but I am. God damn it, Olga, I mutter under my breath. There's no way Mama Jacinta's house will have the internet, so there's no point in trying to smuggle the laptop to Los Ojos. The safest place to keep it is in Olga's room, since I'm nearly certain Ama never comes in here. And if she finds it, she wouldn't know what to do with it. I remember that my cousin Pilad said there were new cyber cafes in town. The computers are supposedly old as hell, but still, maybe I can read the rest of the emails once I get there. I put the receipt inside my journal.